this time the children's church will dismiss and if you're online thank you for joining us this morning and don't forget to do a shout out on who's online because we don't always see everybody and how many are with you that we may pray for you this week and if you got any prayer requests please put them up there or message me privately and uh, we'll be glad to uh, add them to our prayer list this week turn our Bibles over to the book of Luke Luke 13 verses 6 through 9 Luke 13 actually verses 1 through 9 is dealing with repentance and coming back to God the Bible is very adamant that repentance is essential to salvation as we see John the Baptist came preaching repentance Jesus preached repentance the disciples preached repentance and one of the things that I have talked to several of my pastor friends about and even my both fathers is finding gospel tracts that even have the word in it anymore and it's my pet peeve I understand that you must accept and I understand you must believe and I understand you must confess and they that's how the new churches do ABC's for salvation however does not the Bible say the be the devils believe and tremble but does it make him a Christian no and so this is where as you look at the Word of God you'll see that over time the devil wants to dilute key issues and this is one of them a lot of churches no longer say anything about repentance but the Bible says here I tell you nay but except you repent you will all likewise perish that's pretty serious you know believing Christ came to save for us does not make us that we're willing to change from our sins a lot of people believe in God I've got friends that are great moral friends they believe in God but they've never trusted him as their Savior. And this is why Jesus is dealing with this, and then all of a sudden, he, as he's talking to the disciples, he says in verse 6, he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come and seek fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, and why cumbereth it in the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we open the word and we look at this parable of the unfruitful fig tree, Years it had grown, beautifully, lush, but barren. Lord, help us as we look at this application of this passage of Scripture on how this is applied to the children of Israel, but also an admonition to the disciples that God's patience only lasts so long upon mankind. Lord, I ask you that you would continue to lead God and direct in the preaching and the message that you would use my words and my heart for your honor and your glory. That I may be able to speak the truth of God's word with conviction and power. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for everyone here this morning and those online. Help them to listen attentively as the message is preached. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As Jesus is dealing with this, the problem arose time and time again where the Pharisees had their mantra, had their religion, and they kept adding to the law. Today is no different. As a pastor, I'm getting a lot of questions. For 15 years, tons of questions. God's word has not changed, but it's amazing how people keep going, I found something new. Family members of mine, pastor friends of mine I've got pastor friends one of the very first churches that helped Community Baptist start our John and Roman campaign I think that week was 12,000 John and Romans it's closed today it's closed today three years ago they put a for sale sign on the building and the church disbanded 
The very first church that came all the way up here to help us do something great is closed because the pastor started questioning the validity of Scripture. They started questioning, well, I just don't know if I believe it. I think we're taught wrong here. And I think next thing you know it, gone. Marriage separated. Church gone. Folks, you start questioning scriptures. And this is what's happening. We become an unfruitful nation. What has happened? The Pharisees read through the Gospels. The Pharisees started adding to questioning. And when Jesus Christ actually came, they're like, you're not it. This is what the devil does. He loves to divide. He loves to split. He loves to get us divid divided in that aspect. And Christians, we should not fall into it. Be common sense. Look at things. What is God's focus for your life? What is God's focus for you? And as we look at this, what was the purpose of the fig tree? There's one purpose. Can you guess? Bear fruit. It wasn't to blossom. It wasn't to grow big and bushy. It wasn't to look pretty and give shade. It was to bear fruit. John 15 is entirely written to the church and saying, you must bear fruit. We've got farmers in the sanctuary. I know about growing grass seed and a few other things to take care of the animals I have. It frustrates me to no end. When I pay all that money for grass seed and I do everything that label says and nothing comes up, I've dunged it, I've fertilized it, I've tilled it up, I've done everything, and I'm like, that's weeds. So then I began to wonder if a certain seed company sold me a bag of $200 junk. And so now I'm trying another bag because after four years of this brand, I'm not really impressed with the results. I know I can't read at times. I know I'm illiterate when it comes to following instructions. However, it's pretty simple. Place in hopper, drive tractor, spread. And it's supposed to be the rest, but it doesn't happen. So as a person, I can't imagine raising crops or animals and having nothing happen. You invest all that time and effort and nothing happened. Now let's look from the Lord Jesus' port. What has he invested in us? What has he invested in us? Are we a good return on the investment? This is something we have to think about in light of eternity. Are we, would God say, son, that person Gordon turned out to be a horrible investment. This return was negligible at best. I got an apple that size. He's been saved since 1978, and you're serious? This is all we get out of this tree? One little fruit since 1978. Now, I'm adding a little humor in there, but think about how it looks from the Lord's point. The Father is looking at him going, why isn't your church producing? Years ago, I heard a message, and my wife and I laughed at it. Is your church pregnant? You know, the churches are supposed to be reproducing, are we not? That's what the Bible says. But how many churches actually reproduce other churches? How many people are bearing other sheep? Shepherds don't bear sheep. They lead sheep. The sheep is supposed to be. And guess what? When I'm not a shepherd, I'm a sheep. Isn't that amazing? I'm an under-shepherd to the shepherd, but I'm still a sheep that needs to be barren sheep. But are we barren? And it's the fig tree without fruit. That is something that two trees were very predominant in the Palestine and the land of the Lord. That was the fig tree and the olive tree. Both were symbolizations of Israel. Israel had been given so much. Think about what God did for Israel. Brought them out of captivity and gave them everything they can imagine. And yet, look what they did. Let's even go back before. God touched a man named Abraham in the land of Ur, the Chaldees, and says, go until I tell you a land. And where you walk, that's it. Wow. Wow. Then his great-great-grandson goes to Egypt, 
for food stays there for 400 years, they have to go back into the land that was already given to them and take it back. And then they do it, and God blesses them with cities, with wealth, with uh, vineyards, with everything. And yet, in a matter of time, the book of Judges says, every man did what was right in his own heart. Just that quick. Unfruitful. God would have to send them into tribulation. Had to send them in captivity. Had to send them in famine. Had to send them in this. Bring them back. Send them back. Bring them back. Send them. No wonder the Lord gives this parable. Now this has been 400 years of silent time between Malachi and Matthew, and here is the books, the synoptic gospels being taught, and God is walking in the flesh of a man as a son of God, and he's seeing what's happened to his nation. Apostasy. Here's the Pharisees interpreting God's laws as they, they, at, at whim. And he's like, you're whited sepulchers. You're the blind leading the blind. And so he keeps giving parables, and they're like, we don't understand. Well, that was a port. They're heavenly story with earthly meaning. There's a purpose to them. And he nails it home by twice saying, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you'll likewise perish. Twice. Why did he say it twice? Because it is important. Without the repentance, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Without turning and picking up the cross, the Bible says, you cannot be my disciple. The Bible's pretty strong about what it means to be a disciple of God. And it's not pick and choose. A couple weeks ago, I was laughing because some people must think other people were born last night. And I'm reading an article, and they're talking about beliefs and how they're changing. No, God's word doesn't change. I don't care how you want to slice it and dice it. But it's amazing how people love to get into things. And my first question, when everybody wants to get into false doctrine, how are you on soul winning? How are you on this? How are you on that? Because what I found out with my own personal family with my own people that I know. When they found a new doctrine, they focused so much on that and never focused on winning souls anymore. They were trying to convert Christians and tell them they're wrong. And I thought, huh. Well, as I was reading this, I shared this with a pastor friend of mine, and we were chuckling. He goes, what do you see missing, Gordon? I said, there's nothing on this page about winning souls. He says, mm hmm What does symbolization of fruit bring? Mean? What did Paul say? That I may bear fruit to your account. You know the greatest thing about a missionary? I was reading Brother Haley's comment this morning of some things, and it touched my heart. Their service is already done. They're six hours ahead. But if someone in Ghent Baptist Church in Ghent, Belgium, gets saved because we support Brother Haley, that's fruit to your and I's account. Fruit. Isn't that interesting how the Lord says fruit? And this is what the purpose of a tree is to bear fruit. If I am hungry, you know it's nice. This year, I don't know what happened. But the year before, when we moved to our place, there are hundreds of feral apple trees. They're not very big, but they're just everywhere. This year, there was hardly any growing. Don't know what happened. But as we went through the, the last year, it was neat just to you know, grab an apple, take a bite, and enjoy it. I love that. Just, there it is. Fresh tree. Wow. They weren't real sweet, but I was like, yeah, you'd kind of pick and choose which one was good, but horses eat everything. They don't care what it is. They make apple juice every time. However, it was neat to see a tree loaded with fruit. And this year, they were barren. Odd year, maybe. But this is where... God is always implying that a child of God should always be focusing on the lost. And every time we see God dealing with the Pharisees, you know what the Pharisees were trying to do? Convince people to follow them so that they can get more money. 
They weren't trying to bring people to the kingdom of God. And every parable almost has the same implication. It's always after the religious people that are trying to change God's ways to convert people to themselves and not to God. And this is where when you hear something, and in 15 years I have a dossier on different things that I've heard, and I'm still just going straight. Because they'll come and go. The gentleman I was telling you about, his church was a pretty powerful, dynamic church. Mission trips, large youth group, church just seemingly on fire for the Lord. And I was like, wow. I almost thought, Lord, help me be like that church modeling after it. I mean, they are really people getting saved and people getting baptized. And they literally were going down to the Potomac River in Virginia and baptizing because they did not have a baptism. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know if I want to go to the Potomac River. It's a little dirty. It's like going down the River Nile and other places. But however, there was something going on and it was exciting. But all of a sudden, he said, a friend and I have been discussing this. And you know, it was almost like the devil was reaching over. Guys, you know, we've done it. You know, hit that candle and tsk, got the light out. And it was sad. And it just, in a matter of six years, it just went to where when they closed, they had 12 people. This is what the devil's doing and guess what they spent their more time on? Hey, Brother Horton, I was thinking about it. Can we talk about this? No, we can't. I'm not going to give ear to it. I'm not going to give time to it because that's what he's doing. He's spending more time calling me and other pastors and saying, this is what I found. No more reaching out like the Pharisees were no longer telling people, hey, the blood of the Lamb, the blood of the atonement was for a purpose. We're to be looking for the Messiah. When the Messiah came, you're not it. They became unfruitful. What is happening in 2020? There's many churches, but our trees look just like that. They're full, they're beautiful, but there's no fruit. And after a while, what does the trees look like today? All the beautiful maple trees are barren. The owner of the fig tree expected it to bear fruit. You know, it's something interesting. I want to read something to you about Israeli planning. Notice the Bible says three years. Three years. Okay. Let me tell you something about the law. In the book of Leviticus, according to Leviticus 19, 23 to 25, fruit from a newly planted tree was not eaten the first three years. You could not, by law, biblical law, touch the tree for the first three years. And the fourth year, every fruit of those trees belonged to the Lord as a tithe. Then on the fifth year, the owner, the husbandman we see here, can actually harvest for himself. So remember this. He said three years he's come by. He legitimately had three years of coming by. After four years, he couldn't touch it. So seven years, and gentlemen and ladies, if we were planting a garden for seven years and nothing ever came up, I'd give up. What's the point? It's not going to grow, so no use doing it. But seven years, and then the caretaker says, Lord, one more year, please. Let me put a little bit extra love into this tree. Let me dig it around. And what they would do is they would dig a trench about a foot or so deep and pack it with sheep manure. And they would cover it back up, and they would water it constantly and allow the manure to seep into the roots and hoping that it was just missing something. You know what? Digging a foot in that dirt in, in Israel <laughs> was a chore. We all know what it's like digging in a rocking ground. It's just like you dig a few inches, and you're like, I'm done. They didn't have the hose they didn't have the shovels we do today. If you ever look at biblical shovels, <laughs> I don't know how they dug anything. They were flat and heavy iron. They're, they're huge. But he says, let me put some time into it, Lord. 
This man had been waiting for seven years for fruit. No wonder he wanted to cut it down. How many years has God, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, waited for fruit from us? This parable has an application to individuals and to the nation of Israel. God is gracious. He is so gracious and long-suffering toward people. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, please. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come, there's that word again, to repentance. Aren't you glad God's own word said he's long-suffering and he's patient? Boy, I could tell you one thing. I'm not deserving of his patience. I'm not deserving his long suffering. Think about A.D. 33. God's son walked Calvary's hill for man because he loved you and I. 2020, people are still spitting in the face of God. And he's still patient. He's still long suffering. How many more years? To be honest, I pray many, that God would still see people saved. And the other part of me is like, John, even so, come quickly, Lord, let's get this place a mess. But you know what happens? The moment we're gone, that grace ceases to exist. The Holy Spirit is removed. That means, what about my friends? What about my countrymen that I love so dearly? They won't have what you and I have. As you look at the Word of God, He has every right to cut us down. But in His mercy, He spared us. Yet we must not presume upon the kindness and long-suffering of the Lord, for the day of judgment will never come. But the tree also reminds us of God's special goodness to Israel. How many times have Israel tested God's patience? I was reading through Numbers, and I thought, man, Moses was a special man. I could not have put up with what he did. I mean, no wonder the Bible said he was a meek man. No, I, and you know what? I don't blame Moses one bit for getting mad at the people. And calling you stiff-necked heathen people. I think after leading them for a few years, I'd have been mad too. They would have probably had my father-in-law there for uh, uh, anger management issues because I would have had a few of them. You know, how many, can I just hit you one of this with my rod and help maybe feel better or something? But here is God continued 40 years. But God's judgment did come on some. Korah who rebelled against Moses in the leadership, swallowed up by the earth. Those that refused God and murmured and complained about, oh, more manna, oh, more of this. He sent serpents, fiery serpents. We know them as adders. And you know what he did? He put a brazen serpent on a pole and said, look and live. Ah, I'm not going to look at that. I mean, how simple, folks. Look and live. And yet people like, nah, whatever. How's that? That's just an old wives' tale. Oh, that's just a witchery. Oh, that's, that's, that's a joke. But how many day, people today in our own families, we say look and live. And they're like, you know, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, brother, sister, that, that works for you. But, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my own path. I've heard it, and I know you have. And if you are a child of God, it breaks your heart to see how a foolish decision that was. How many people, can you imagine a father or a mother looking at their son and say, just look at the serpent and live? Nah, dad and mom, and watching your son die. That's how we ought to feel. When our neighbors are dying around us and saying, you know what, I'm not interested, they're spiritually dying. 
Day by day they get hardened. And what the Bible wants us to be is fruitful. They want us to, one reason God so symbolizes the tree of fruit is this. The tree offers food. Even Jesus, remember one of the parables, we'll get to it eventually. He's walking by a tree and he's hungry and he reaches up for it. There's nothing and he curses the tree. The purpose of the tree is to bring forth life and fruit. And if we are a child of God, people ought to say, I want that fruit. You know what a fruit is? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, so on and so forth. Christians, if we're not exhibiting that fruit, people will say, I want that. Or, I don't want that. You know, feral trees are there because birds do their business all over the other trees and they grow and they have the seeds in them and so on. But it doesn't mean they're good as what is at Algoma or otherwise. Those trees have been carefully manicured and to deliver sweet, delicious apples. Those other trees are wild. They're not sweet. They've not been cared for. We may be Christians. We may be bearing some fruit, but our fruit is not what the Lord wants us to be bearing. And somebody takes a bite and goes, hmm. There's one tree that's close to the round pin. And if I take a bite out of that one, it's like, wow, okay, here you go, horse. You can have it. It's bad. There's a difference. It doesn't bring me pleasure. So that, guess what? The rest of the year, I'm like, I ain't touching that one. That one's, mm, that's a pucker power of 10. It's sour. And that's where you look at Christians and some of you are like, I don't want that Christianity. Boy, they're forever puckered up. You know, boy, they're not happy about anything. Well, I don't want a part of that Christianity. And others ones, why are they so happy? They just lost their parents. They just lost this. They just had this happen. Look at the world around them, and they're smiling. What do they have different that I don't have? What fruit would you rather have? A guy that's walking around tripping on his lower lip or a guy that's going around whistling how great thou art? Yeah, the world will make fun of you. But I want to ask you four, three thoughts this morning. And we'll close. And I want you to think about them. Is God's patience waning in your and I's life? Is God's patience coming to an end? Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. In verse 18, the Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Notice our God is long suffering and a great mercy. He is forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he's not clearing the guilty who refuse to repent. It is passed on to the generation after generation. The Bible says in Exodus 34 and verse 6, And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. The Lord, the Lord. You just have to open up the book of Psalms. <laughs> and it is full of that same. Let's go to Psalm 86, please. Psalm 86 and verse 13. Psalm 86 and verse 13. Psalms 86 and verse 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. For great is thy mercy. God's patience is a blessing. God's patience is not to be taken for granted. Dads, how many times have we ever said you're getting on my last nerve and my patience is getting thin. We've all been there as parents. 
our patience is getting thin. As I was reading an article and I was, I was laughing, sometimes parents' patience getting thin is because of our own fault. We don't deal with the issue when it needs to be dealt with. And we bring it on ourselves. But God's not that way. God deals with us. I won't make you raise your hand, but how many times has God sent you through a trial to wake you up? Whom he loving and he chasing betimes. I don't have enough hands and fingers to raise how many times he's whooped me. But he does it to remind us he's still there. But even as a father, I've disciplined my girls, but it hasn't corrected the problem. They still have that rebellious in their heart. So we have to deal with it again and again until they don't want to be dealt with again. The problem is we have to be consistent and God is always consistent. He's not like us that we're too tired to discipline. We don't feel like discipline. We don't this, that. No, God will discipline. We think because God doesn't discipline on his, our timetable that he's forgot about us. Oh, no. God has not forgot about us. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. Hundred plus years that boat was made. That ark was made. And it said, Noah preached and they did not, only eight souls. But isn't that God's mercy? That ark was big enough for people to be on, but they refused His mercy. God's love and the blood shed on Calvary is for the whole world. It's big enough for everyone to get saved. But they won't. Nahum 1.3 tells us that God's mercy is great. 2 Peter 3, 9, Romans 2, 4. All these tell about God's mercy, God's long-suffering, but man's inability to accept it. November 21st, 2 a.m. in the morning, God touched my heart in the Hyatt Hotel in Quito, Ecuador to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember the night before, two days before actually, we had the privilege of going into the jungles to the Aki Indians to see where Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and the other three gentlemen gave their life for Jesus Christ to reach this tribe for Jesus Christ. They landed their little Piper plane on a sandbar that we landed on. You have to be a very good pilot, I'll put it that way. And as we landed, the pilot turned to me and said, this is where five, li five lives were taken and were ushered into the presence of God. I said, wow. As we went into the village and went through the jungle, we heard singing in a thatched rough church. And a young short man, Aki Indians are about four, five, four, six. They're very short. There was a young man leading singing. I don't know the Aka language, but I do know amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. The man that was preaching spoke in Spanish to the missionary and said, I am the great grandson of one of the killers. And because of Mama Saint and Mama Elliot, we have a church here. And almost every Aka Indian knows Jesus Christ, their personal Savior. Five men had to give their life for a nation, a tribe, to be saved. 
And as I boarded the plane, the Indians helped push the plane to the back of the sandbar. Now remember, we're down in a river. And the guy's name was Randy Jackson. I'll never ask him if he was a famous pitcher. He said he was not. He's from Tennessee. Missionary aviation flight. We got that plane. He revved it. And he says, pray, Brother Horton, pray. I said, why? He says, we got to get off and over the trees. So I was praying, and Brother Clanton was with me in the back. And he got that plane to the farthest reach of that sandbar, and he just gunned it. And when he got enough RPM on there, he released the brake. And, you know, tires and sand don't go very well, even though they're sand tires. And just about at the end of the sandbar, he pulls back on that yoke, and we go straight up over the tree. He goes, praise God, we made it. I'm like, oh, man. But he says, Brother Horton, would you like me to turn around and look at the sandbar? I said, yeah. So I'm in the passenger seat, and I overlook the thing, and the Lord touched my heart and said, how much would you be willing to give me? That just struck me because I had been complacent I had been running from God since I was 16, 1988, and this is now 2003. I said, Lord, didn't answer him. As tears streamed down my face, I tried to hide it, and I just went on. We got back to the hotel, and because that was a Wednesday, Thursday night, two of the missionaries preached, and one preached out of Haggai 1. I said, if not now, When? When are we going to serve the Lord? When we're ready? When we got all our ducks in a row? And he started going down the line. And he named me every step of the sermon. The next guy got up. He took a blank piece of paper and he said, God has made your life a beautiful canvas for him to paint a masterpiece on. But he tore a corner off and he said, that's what we give God. And we take the rest and he pulled out his child's scribbling. He says, we make it look like this. A precious piece. Instead of a Picasso. I went to bed that night. And I, like all good Baptists, thought I had heartburn and just to go to sleep and forget about the conviction. Two o'clock in the morning I woke up and the thought was in my mind like the Lord was speaking to me sitting on my bed will you pick up your father's mantle this was God's patience and I said Lord you don't know how I've lived you don't know how I've dishonored my family and dishonored you I cannot preach the gospel I must be blameless running from the Lord I was not always doing what a Christian should be doing far from it but I went back to sleep, or so I thought. What seemed to be hours sleeping was only minutes. And I woke back up, but this time something was different. Remember, Ecuador is on the equator. It is not cold. But the room was ice cold, and there felt like there was somebody squeezing on my shoulder. And the verse, there is a sin unto death. Who will pick up your father's mantle? I knew Right then and there, if I would have said no, God would have taken me home. That room was colder than I can ever imagine. And that pressure on my shoulder reminded me that it was a hand of God saying, the choice is yours now. I've sent you through car accidents, accidents on the job, everything else to get your attention and you've ignored me. My patience is up. And when I say there is a time unto death, I'm telling you, don't try God's patience because you never know when it's coming. If you know to do right and do it not, it is sin, period. You can slice it, you can dice it any way you want to put your theology to it. But if you're not obeying God in any way, shape, or form, the Bible says if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. God's law is infinite. God's law is black and white. This is why when I remember that night, I remember the resounding yes and the peace. And I called my wife the next morning on a calling card that cost me almost $30 U.S. for five minutes. 
And I said, "Hun, when I get home, we need to talk. God was working. And no doubt about it, when I got home, my wife knew exactly what God did in my heart. Exactly. Even to where we were going back to. Folks, when God works on one heart, he's working on the other. We're a team. and We always have been. But God had to use a lot of horrible circumstances in my life because of my stupidity and my stubbornness. But as I was on the airplane flying back from Quito to Miami, I opened up my Bible and began reading and God gave me the verse, Romans 13, 11. Now is the high time to wake out of our sleep. It's time for us to stop sleepwalking and thinking this is not real. Because our salvation draweth near. God can come back anytime. Anytime. But the problem is the church is not ready for him to come back. I have so many people that put on Facebook and I have to laugh. Bless God if the people tell the church to close, we're going to go anyway. They're not here now. <laughs> if you're not going to come now, don't tell me if they put armed guards out, you're going to come all of a sudden get a backbone. I don't think so. If I can't find you a couple days a week and only one time a month or whatever, don't tell me you're going to come out now. Because if you can't do it now, you're not going to do it then. If you're not going to stand up for God now, if you're not going to witness now, you're not going to witness then. How do you know? I know. Been there. God's desire for us is not only that we heed his patience. Listen to it. But it's also God's desire... Is God's desire for your fruitfulness complete? Is his patience waning with us? Is his God's desire for your fruitfulness complete? Are you as fruitful as he wants you to be? Are you a 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold Christian? God doesn't expect us all to be an Oswald J. Smith down at People's Church. That's not, or D.L. Moody, or David Livingston. Mary Schlesser. But he wants us to be fruitful just like he gave some two talents, five talents, ten talents, or one, two, and five. Every one of us has different talents, but are you utilizing the talents God's given you? John 15. John 15, please. God has a purpose. When I landed in the airport, I normally do not turn on my cell phone when I'm going through customs. It is not looked on very nicely to be on the phone while you're talking to either CBSA or the Border Patrol. It's not a good idea. I turned on my phone the moment I landed for whatever reason, but God knew I did. And as I'm standing in the line of customs, my phone rings. I look down and it says, Daddy Horton. And I open up the phone. And he says, Son, so what good news you've got to tell me? I said, What? He said, Well, did God call you to preach while you're down there? I said, How do you know? He says, Mom and I have always known. And we've prayed, God, do whatever it takes. For you to fill your calling. And I thought, wow. So I said, Dad, I'm at customs. I'll call you back later. I get home. I had the church van. I dropped the few people off that part of our church group that went to Ecuador. And I pulled in, and my pastor is never usually there on a Saturday, but he was. And I walk into the office, give him the keys of the van. He looks over his glasses and he looks at me and said, so you preaching tomorrow night? I said, do what? I said, I just got in. He said, well, are you preaching? He said, God call you to preach? And I said, I guess I am. He said, no, you either are or you're not. So that was my first message, and you would have loved it, gentlemen and ladies. It was less than 15 minutes. <laughs> Time has progressed. No, I realize the importance of teaching and preaching of God's word. Was I nervous and scared to death? Absolutely. But I realized I found no greater joy than to preach God's word. 
you know, God has a purpose. And his desire for me was to bear fruit as a pastor. Has it been easy? No. Have I faced ridicule, persecution for what I've stood for? Yes. But I wouldn't trade it for a moment. God's desire is in John 15, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may be bring forth more fruit. Don't think trials are a bad thing. As a pastor, I've been through a lot. But you know what God's doing? Pruning me so that I can bear better fruit. When you go through trials, ladies and gentlemen, precious church, God's just working on you. He's showing you how much he loves you. Trying to help you grow more. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you accept you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth more, much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. One of the greatest things I can realize is God is there all the time. God's desire for your fruitfulness hasn't changed. He wants his church to be a bearing church, a pregnant church, a reproducing church. Are we that as a person? But before we do what we're doing, we got to be to be in, in other areas. We can't just pick and choose. Going back to my friend and pastor, wherever he is today. He started picking and choosing the doctrines he wanted to believe. You can't pick and choose. He picked some apart, chose another one. And yet, practicing things that were contrary to God's word. And then saying, Gordon, you've got to listen. I found something. No, no, no. If you're not practicing in this area, how come you're finding something in this area? God doesn't contradict himself. So when people come to you, and they bring things to you. Look at their tree. Look at their tree. It's not bad to look at the tree. I do it. Anytime anybody sends me a link, before I even watch, before I even read, I check the person out. And I find out what background. And then if they're not of the background of sound doctrine, I don't listen to them. I don't even read them. Why? The Bible says give not an ear. If they're contradicting themselves and in their church, why do I need to listen to them? Christians, we need to apply the same thing. It's important. God's judgment is coming soon in our life. Whether it's here on earth, whether it's in heaven. Mine came. My final warning came. On November 21st, 2003. God has sent me through five car accidents. And one day in August of 96, I had an ambulance ride for the first time that I was not in the front seat. I got off my loader and it was loaded full of logs heading for the logging truck. I had to go discuss something with the foreman. And as I was talking to him, next thing I felt something hit my face harder than I've ever been hit before. And I don't remember anything other than that besides being in an ambulance. The thing I vaguely remember before that ambulance ride was someone shaking me, please don't die, please don't die, it was my foreman. And then call 911, call 911, get them here, get them here. And I don't remember anything else. As I'm sitting in the hospital, getting my eyes pulled up, and checked for lights and seeing if I'm responsive and somebody dabbing my face with cloths and things like that. And then the sound of the MRI and the x-ray machines, 
I hear the doctor look at me when I come out of it and says, Son, you must have an angel looking out for you. You are so lucky today. I said, Why? He said, Someone got on your loader that was not authorized to drive it, and one of the trees was connected to a tree that was across the rock box, and it flung and hit you directly in the face. And your nose bone has stopped a millimeter from your brain. He said, don't ever get in a fight again. You'll be dead. He says, why you weren't killed all the way? I don't know. He says, someone's looking out for you. You know what? Right then I knew my heart said, are you listening? I'm like, okay. I started going to church more. But that's not what God wanted. Going to church did not alleviate what he did in 1988 in Chilliwack, uh, Faith Baptist Church in Chilliwack when that missionary spoke about surrendering the life. Going to church, giving tithe, is if God's got a purpose for your life, he's not going to be happy until you fulfill it. And as I got out of the hospital, even to this day, my nose is messed up. But it's a reminder of God's patience and God's grace. One of the final straws in my life was I was checking Brother and Mrs. Nye's house and heading home. I was, took one of the larger wreckers from my boss. He said it has may pop tires on it. And if anybody knows what that is, they may pop any time. And it was a large 10-ton wrecker. And it was just, I had to drop it off at the shop. That was it and pick up the other one there and be done. So I said, I'll go to my mom and dad's house and check their mail and do some things, and then I'll head back to Winder. Well, as I'm driving home, the rain starts falling harder. I mean, it's a torrential southern downpour. And I called my wife and I said, I'll be a little bit longer. I'll be home in a few minutes. And I was only about 15 minutes away from home. And as I come up a hill to the stop sign, I thought, Instead of using the brakes, I'm going to downshift. Well, I did. But because there was no traction on the back tires, I started to go sideways, and I went off the embankment. The truck began rolling down the embankment. I was not wearing a seatbelt. When it finally came to rest, the driver's side was in the river, and I climbed out the passenger seat, and a lady behind me was standing on the hill going, Are you okay? I'm fine. She said the truck went everywhere. And I saw the hood over here. I saw something over here. And the front window shield was gone. And yes, it should have been a disaster. But good old Caterpillar engine, it was still running. So I reached back in there and shut it off. Then I had to call my boss and say, <clears throat> your truck is down here. Would you bring another wrecker to pull your wrecker out of the ditch? So the lady goes, you're not hurt. But you know what's God's merciful? The firefighter that came was one I served with, was a born-again Christian. He says, man, God must have something special for you, Gordon. He's looking at the truck. He says, you walked out of there. But in my office is a Bible my mom gave me on my graduation in June of 1990. I realized my cell phone, my Bible are in the truck. I opened up the door and there my Bible was floating in the water with my cell phone on top of it. The Bible is not messed up at all, except for the cover. I refuse to have it replaced. And you open it up, and my mom's beautiful calligraphy says to our son on his graduation, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's a reminder that God is real. When people say that, oh, I've seen a fire and the Bible's alive, I can believe it. My Bible floated. You can believe it what you want, but that Bible should have been out the front window, should have been out. I mean, we went end over end. It should have been everywhere. And my cell phone should have been, who knows? I mean, it was the little cell phones from back in the 1990s, the ones you paid $3,000 for. No, just kidding. But it was literally like this. It wasn't there long that was in July. God got my attention in November. God has patience. 
But the question is, is God's judgment coming soon in our lives? Because there is a sin unto death. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, And have ye forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the, loveth, the Lord loveth, he chasten, and scourgeth every son from whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as a son's. For what son is he whom the father chasten not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all our partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereof. Jesus pointed out what would happen to the tree if it was not growing within a year. Have you been enjoying God's special treatment without giving anything in return? If so, respond to the gardener's patient care and begin to bear the fruit God has created you to produce. It is significant that the parable was an open-ended parable so that the listeners had to supply the conclusion. Did the tree bear fruit? Did the special care accomplish anything? Was the tree spared or cut down? We don't know the answers. But let's put ourselves as that tree. What's going to happen? We are that tree. So the question is open-ended. Only we can answer that. God is seeking fruit. He will accept no substitutes. And the time to repent is now. The next time you hear about a tragedy that claims many lives, ask yourself, am I next? Am I just taking up God's space? Or am I bearing fruit to the glory of God? I'd ask myself that question as I laid in that bed in Quito, Ecuador. Is it worth running anymore? Is preaching the gospel really all that bad that I thought in my mind? The answer is no. Almost 17 years later. Has it been an easy road? It is never an easy road when you follow the Lord. But I can do all things through Christ who has strengthened me. He is my fortress. He is my strength. Are we in a popularity contest? Nope. Never will be. Only person I want to be popular with is Christ my King. And the Word of God. This is the importance of this parable. Is to remind us that this question is open-ended. We don't know what happened to the tree. Just like we don't know what happens going to us. Everyone online and on here this morning will hear the same conclusion. What does God want from you? Are you trying God's patience? Is God's judgment coming on your life like it did mine? I'm here to tell you, people laugh about the judgments. But when God starts whooping, it's no fun. There are things I wish I could go back and redo. But I can't. But I'm thankful God's mercy and long-suffering won out over my stubbornness. If you're here today or online, what's your answer to God this morning? How long have you been unbarren? If you are barren fruit, how much fruit are you really barren? Is there room for improvement? These are questions I ask myself every time I study the messages. How fruitful am I? Am I doing all that I can do? And the answer is we can all do more. 
possession me. But some of us here have never borne fruit. We're saved. We love the Lord. But we've never gone that extra mile. We've never really, we look good. But we haven't bore fruit for His honor and glory. Will you say to the Lord today, Lord, help me. Dig a little deeper. Put a little bit more manure. Water me a little bit more. So that I can be a fruitful tree for your honor and your glory. How many more years we have? I don't know. How many more days? Don't know. All I know is our life is as a vapor. Let's live. As the Bible says in Ephesians, redeem the time for the days are evil. Make your minutes count for the Lord. Be a fruitful tree. People are looking for something to satisfy their hunger. I pray that they can find it on your tree and mine. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for the grace that you showed in each and every one. Lord, thank you for the long suffering that you've shown the world. Lord, if there's one that's online or here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, do not let them leave without trusting Christ. Father, if there's Christians here that are haphazardly serving, whether here or online, let this be a gentle reminder of your patience, of your long sufferingness. May my testimony of what God did in my life be a reminder to others how great our God is. But He deals with each one of us differently. And He reminds us how much He loves us with each chastisement, with each trial, to get our attention to say, Son, daughter, come on home. Lord, I ask you that you just work in our hearts in a way that only you, the Holy Spirit, can do. Draw us to your precious bleeding side. Thank you for all you've done for us, Lord, and ask you to dismiss with your blessing. Help us to think about these three questions. Is God's patient wearing out? What's God's purpose for our life? And is God's judgment near to us now? Lord, I ask you just to help us not to forget these questions when we read this passage. Use it, I pray, for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you tonight, 6 o'clock, as we study on the final judgments. Looking forward to teaching on that tonight. Lord bless and have a great afternoon. If you're online, make sure you tell us who's on there with you and how many with you. And thank you for joining us. Lord bless.